The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. That and I, I've discovered that we have a lot less knowledge in this area about salt than in other areas. Um, back, uh, back west, we've got, uh, well, the following is a little more entrenched at this point. So anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about getting started with salt. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about the main philosophies and ideas behind salt. And, um, and that should give a good overview as to why they're different from some similar tools in the, uh, in the area. So uh, this first talk is going, to be, is going to be kind of a lengthy overview of those ideas of what the, what the basic system is. And we're going to cover a few key topics that kind of get proliferated out throughout all of the context of SALT. And we're also going to go over how to install and set up SALT, which is generally and hopefully a very easy thing to do. Now, if you guys want to follow along um, with some of the examples, you're more than welcome to. I'm going to be using uh, Fedora 17, but we are in YUM back to Fedora 15, and we're in Apple. If you've got any of, uh, any of those distributions available in a VM or on your system, we are also um, have uh, have a PPA if you're running Ubuntu, um, or we're in we're in Portage for Gen 2. We're in the Arch Linux AUR. We're in the FreeBSD ports tree. So if you want to follow along and install in a virtual machine or on your or directly on your system, then make sure you've got an environment ready. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk a little bit about how authentication works in SALT, how uh, remote execution works, and some of the fundamental design concepts behind it. Now, the main reason why I developed SALT, um, I've, worked, I've worked for a number of companies that I needed to deploy cloud-like infrastructures. Um, granted, we've only been calling them that for a few years, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, virtual machine-like infrastructures. And the problem that I kept running into with a lot of existing virtual machine deployment tools, um, especially a few years ago, they've, they've improved greatly in the last, just in the last year, um, but a few years ago was that a lot of them relied on cached data. And um, in a lot of situations, I was finding the cached data as to where virtual machines were inside of, the, inside of the cloud controllers to be incorrect or to be out of date. And so I wanted to deploy a system where I was able to query live data about an infrastructure and find out where virtual machines were. And so I developed a few remote, parallel remote execution systems and found that over and over again, either they couldn't scale because the master ended up using far too much RAM to to bring up a thousand or so SSH connections at once, and then it wasn't very fast anyway. Um, or, uh, or if I was using serial or XML RPC systems, then yeah, those weren't fast enough either, because I needed something that was able to look at a large group of systems all at once and use it inside of an API and not have to hang out for it to finish. And so I found a system called ZeroMQ. Uh, ZeroMQ is a networking library that, uh, that was developed to, to deliver some interesting network topologies back out um, uh, via an API. And so it, it stemmed out of the AMQP projects that were developed a few years ago. If, those, if uh, you're not familiar with AMQP, I've, I've discovered a lot of people aren't. Um, AMQP was a project, a number of banks, financial institutions, and large software companies got together a few years ago and said, we want to create a, a new way to pass information around on a network. And as one might expect, if you get a lot of banks and large software companies together to, 
to um, cooperate on the deployment of a piece of software is going to end up being somewhat large, have probably more features than you could ever need, and a little bloated. And so they had brought in a consultant to help them develop AMQ, um, AMQP. And this individual felt as though the project was going in that direction. I'll, I'll leave individuals up to decide whether or not they think that's what happened. <laughs> um, but that's what he felt. And so he split off and developed 0MQ, which is um, an API that allows you to build these functions directly into an application so that you're able to use the core aspects of this AMQP system, the really good ideas from it, and just those, and then build them into your application. Which means that unlike AMQP, you don't need to have a dedicated broker sitting out there on your network. You don't need to have a RabbitMQ server or an ActiveMQ server sitting out on your network that you're constantly communicating with. You can build all of that communication, all of those communication constructs directly into your application. And so I found 0MQ and gave it a shot and realized that finally I'd found the way to communicate with lots and lots of servers very quickly and get that information back. And so I developed SALT to do that for remote execution. I developed a uh, prototype cloud controller for a company I was working with at the time. And, um, and, and I really don't suggest using that prototype cloud controller. And ironically, despite the fact that my original intention for SALT was for it to be a cloud controller, I've never released anything of that sort. Um, instead, uh, I built configuration management on top of it uh, a few months later, primarily because I kept running into problems with a few of the existing configuration management tools. And a good friend of mine was goading me to, come on, Tom, you can, you can make one that's better. And, um, and so I made one, and some people agree that it's better. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> anyway. The core idea behind SALT is that having this remote execution system gives us a couple of things into an infrastructure that we generally haven't had before. Um, if you were to look at the, the classic methodology for gaining information about an infrastructure through a monitoring medium, and we've got, we've got some Xenos foo here, um, then, then with a lot of those systems, as you know, you've got agents sitting out on the systems and they're constantly reporting back into a database of some sort, and then you query that data to find out what's going on. Um, one of the main differences with SALT, and I'm not saying that this replaces the functionality of a monitoring system because the scope differs a little, but that is that you can just query and say, what's going on on my thousands of servers, and it just comes back and tells you. Or you can send a command out to actually do anything that you want on thousands of servers or target very specific servers. And so all of the functionality in SALT is based, uh, based on top of this core idea of high-speed remote execution, which is why we've got a bit of a different approach to how we handle things like configuration management. Okay. The other big benefit behind the remote execution system is that we've developed a system-centric API a system-centric set of modules that allow us to do things that are specific to managing systems. And so we've got this workhorse API that does everything from manage files on systems all the way up to manipulating SQL and dealing with solar search engines. And we've had quite a few contributions in the last, just in the last few months. So we're going to talk a lot about how this core API works. Um, one of the talks later on talks about exactly how to extend the core API. It's very, uh, it's, it, the goal was to make it as easy and intuitive to extend as possible. And, um, and talk a little bit about how we access these tools and systems inside of this API via the remote execution and via a few other mediums. Okay. Any questions so far, or am I just becoming boring? Okay. <laughs> now, setting up SALT. The main SALT topology is that we have a SALT master, and that master is a published node. 
that does, well, it does quite a few things. It starts up a number of processes to maintain all of its, all of its background capabilities. And then all of the systems that you connect to, you set up a salt minion on. And these guys all check back into the master and await for commands. Now, as I was saying, we're in a lot of package trees, et cetera, et cetera. And so the easiest way to install salt There we go. Is to uninstall it, or to apt get install it, or to well to get to get it through your through your package manager. We'll have to give this a second, of course. Oh, we're doing rather good. <laughs> um, I'm the salt master. Um, it, it depends. Um, there's, there's a lot of deployments out there where they don't want their master to be con controlled by their master. Um, and there's some where they, where they do. Uh, generally speaking, and, and I'll light on this a little later today, um, uh, you can actually run, for instance, the salt configuration management system without having a master. And the main, the main ideas behind that is that you can have a standalone chunk and deliver it somewhere and set it up, or that you can use salt to salt a salt master. OK. okay. Now, once we've got a salt master, well, actually, I'll talk a little bit about the other ways to install. The uh, salt is written entirely in Python. And so it's also up on PyPy. Um, well, I'm certainly in the camp that I do not think that deploying production code from PyPy is a good idea and that there are system packages for a reason. Um, I'm not going to stop you from doing whatever the devil you want to do in your production system. Um, but you can pip install salt or easy install salt from PyPy. Hey, how's it going? Come on in. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're not too far yet. <laughs> oh, oh! I sometimes I wish I had overslept. <laughs> All right. So, a lot of different ways that you can install salt. You can also. Um, some people are daring enough to actually follow Git, because we we deploy a lot of new features and a lot of new capabilities in salt very very quickly. Um, if we go back and look at the release notes, you'll see um, and the, recent, really, the release notes are available inside of our documentation. Um, but if you go back and look at the release notes, you'll see that we, we will have, say, a three-week bridge between releases and something like 10 exciting new features. So it is, it is under very rapid development. But if you decide to install via Git or install directly via the source tarball, then it's just a setup.py. And um, that setup.py will use, will use pip to download any of the dependencies that are required as well. OK. Let's see if this install is done. And that was embarrassing. I know, what I'm t I know that I should use something else. And obviously, it isn't. <laughs> It is not. We have a PPA. So a PPA in Ubuntu is a personal, what, what does PPA stand for? Thank you. A personal package, ar package archive. And um, there's just a system where you can upload deb files. Um, and then uh, you can use, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'll just, I'll just die on it. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and we've got we've got all the instructions on specific Ubuntu installations inside of our docs. All right, this is a pretty bare bones install. So 
We do. Yes? Okay. Um, we don't have official Debian packages yet. And frankly, if anybody knows anyone who is uh, in with Debian upstream, we really need to get in there. <laughs> Um, yeah, right now on Debian, you do need to do a source install. There we go. That was, I'm, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, we put a lot of effort trying to get into Debian upstream, but we, we just need the better contacts, I guess, at this point. <laughs> All right. So we're finally getting Salt installed, since we've had some download issues already. I'm really excited that we're starting the day off so well. Now, in most package repositories, Salt is split up into three packages. Um, there's Salt itself, which is pretty much the entire library. And most of those libraries are shared between the master and the minion, and then master and minion packages that come with startup scripts or system D or whatever. Okay. So we've got it installed. And to start up the master, all we do is either either run service start master um, because it's going to be put into your init system if you've installed via a package. Or we can start it up by saying let's run it in the foreground in debug mode, which is a great way to see what's going on. The first time that you start up a master is going to create the master side RSA key pair and then start up a bunch of processes. So by default it starts up five worker processes and then it starts up three management, management processes to manage some of the events that occur on the master. Okay. Now, since I don't want the master to be flying off and telling us everything that's going on, I'm going to start it up in as a daemon. There, nice and quiet. Now, similarly, we, can, we now start up the salt minion. There's only one configuration that we need to do on the salt minion before starting it up, and that is make sure that it knows where the salt master is. One of the interesting things about, uh, about the salt minions is that they don't listen on any ports. Only the master listens on ports. And so the minion connects to the master and then binds to one of those ports awaiting commands. Now, what this means is that your minion can still be firewalled into oblivion, which is rather nice, I think. And then the master um, only needs to have these two ports open. One port for bidirectional communication and the other port for ZeroMQ publications. So. If we discover that uh, Vim is not available, okay, then we get to play a build joy old school. So by default, the minions are going to look for the master under the DNS name of salt. So generally, the easiest way to configure this in a larger environment is just set your DNS to have an entry salt pointing back to the salt master. Now, if you don't want to do that, or if you're running tests on your local machine like we are, then we can statically assign where the master is. Now another thing that I'm going to do in here before we move forward, primarily because I don't want this minion to show up as localhost.localhost to the master, when that minion turns on and it checks in, it, it assigns itself an ID. Now by default that ID is going to be whatever it thinks its host name is. But we can statically override this ID. One of the main, there's a couple main reasons for allowing Static over, statically overwriting the ID. The primary one was because um, a supercomputing deployment asked me to make it so that we could have multiple minions running on a single supercompute node. And so we can assign different IDs for different minions and run multiple minions on a single node and then use them as separate communication channels. If, if that's applicable. For most cases, frankly, it isn't. But you could statically assign the ID. So I'll call this guy minion. 
All right. We'll start the minion up. It'll create its keys. Excellent. And then we get informed by the minion, whoa, the master has cached our key and it says that it hasn't been accepted yet. Okay, great, grand, wonderful. So, oh, I thought I fixed that trace when I hit control C. All right, so we'll start the menu in the background and then we'll hop back over here to some slides. Now, we watched this, some keys got generated, and so we're going to talk a little bit about authentication. Now, again, one of the main goals behind SALT is that it is simple, that it is easy to use, easy to understand, and gets out of your way, that you set it up and you don't need to fret, per se. And so, um, the authentication is based on RSA keys, it's very SSH-like. And so we can go in here and take a look at how look at these keys. And we do that with the salt key command. There's got quite a few salt commands, and we'll, we'll cover um, most of them during the course of the day. But so we can run salt key, get a little help message, see all the things we can do with salt key. So we can do everything from generate RSA keys with salt key for salt, um, or we can print existing keys, reject keys, accept keys, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start by just getting a list here, and we see that, yep, we've got an unaccepted key for a minion named a minion. No accepted keys, no rejected keys. And so I can run salt key dash capital A to just say, hey, accept everything. Or we can be a little more prudent and accept an individual key. And so, yay, it's accepted. Now, as you recall, the minion was back there continually every couple of seconds just quietly checking in and saying, am, am I good? And so since it's still running, it has already checked in for us. So we don't need to go in and do anything else. We've turned it on. We've accepted the key. We are done. We now have connection to the minion, and we can boss it about. All right, ooh, I want to show a few more salt key capabilities. Primarily, as we all know, if you're going to accept someone's key, the prudent thing to do is to make sure that you're accepting the right key <laughs> instead of what we all know that we all do, which is just accept keys blindly because we think that's all right, or rather because we don't want to be bothered. <laughs> but so you can run salt key dash capital P to print all public keys that you've, that you've cached from the minions, um, or lowercase p followed by the minion itself. Okay. Yes, I don't have fingerprint printouts in here yet. They're coming, because <laughs> I know they're easier. <laughs> All right. Any questions so far? Arguments, concerns, rebuttals? All right. Now, while we're on the topic of, um, of authentication in SALT, I want to make a quick mention of how to make SALT less secure. Uh, primarily because I've worked, with, I've worked with a number of systems out there, and, and I used to have a job working for a government contractor. And this government contractor worked for the U.S. intelligence community. And many of our deployments existed inside of a bunker, inside of some foreign country, which they would never tell me where, um, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> and they would inform me that they don't really give a crap about network security and authentication, because if somebody gets close enough to actually touch the system, a lot of thermite's going to go off above it, and it's going to melt into the ground or be blown up by a lot of C4 because it's an intelligence system, at which point I would cry because I knew that they had spent $10 million on hardware and hope that that doesn't happen. 
But anyway, the, the gist of that experience um, made me feel as though auto-accepting keys was not a sufficiently insecure ability to add to salt. Now, by default, obviously, these settings are turned off. But if you want to auto-accept your keys because you're a little reckless like that, then you can. More importantly, let's say your keys get messed up somehow and you're very comfortable that, uh, that you haven't been hacked. Or let's say that you are deploying salt inside of a bunker <laughs> and you really don't care about authentication and you want it out of your way completely. Or if you're setting up certain test environments. So for instance, later today, we're going to talk a little bit about the salt test environment, testing system. And that salt testing system uses open mode. But open mode basically says, if I get a key, I'm going to accept it. And if, it, if there's a conflict with an existing key, I'm going to overwrite the existing key. Basically, I'm going to give a big fat middle finger to authentication. Don't use that unless you know what you're doing, is the gist of this. Okay. Now, we're finally going to get into some meat on how to run salt commands. Now, the salt command is broken up into three main groups. We've got the target. We're going to talk a little bit about what this target means. But that's right here. This is how we define who's going to execute a command. We've got the function that we're going to execute. And we're going to talk a little bit about what functions are available, what uh, functions do, and then arguments that are passed to functions. So if we hop back over here, you saw that I did one of these. And it returns, thankfully. It's always during a demo that something goes wrong, right? Now, what we're saying here is we're invoking salt, obviously. And then we've got the target. In this case, the default target mechanism is to, um, is to match minions based on their IDs and using a file system glob. And then we run the function. In this case, the function is test.ping. Test.ping does not ping a minion. It just runs a function called ping in the test module, and all it does is returns true. So that if it's out there, it's going to return true. If you run test.ping and somebody returns false, then, you've, then something bad is going on. <laughs> now, there's a number of different ways that we can, that we can access target, targets inside of salt. So the default is this glob structure. And so file system globs, again, most systems are comfortable with file system globs. If you prefer to uh, crank out a little more power, you can use full PCRE re regular expressions. We do that by passing a capital E option and then giving us a, uh, a PC, uh, well, a regex. So we can come back here and say, that minion's unavailable because I need to escape that. There we go. OK. Next, there's this concept of grains. And I'm going to actually pull out for a second and talk about what grains are. <coughs> and, and grains are system properties. Now, originally, a long, long time ago, when I first wrote, I wanted, I wanted to be able to match or target minions based on system properties. And I actually built Puppet's factor into SALT. So if you're insane and you install SALT 0.7.0, you'll see that it has Ruby as a dependency. But that's been fixed. <laughs> um, but so let's say we want to look at this grain system. Grains deliver static. The whole idea behind grains, the core idea behind grains, is that we have system properties that are completely static, meaning that we have system properties um, that we can preload so that they can be matched very quickly. Because when I run a match for a grain, I don't want to actually query those grains. That takes too long. I mean, we're talking about taking half a second. That's just wrong. That's too long. 
So, um, if we want to see what grains are available, we can use the grains module and check a function in there, run items, and I can misspell it, which um, some people will tell you is a bit of a problem of mine. You know, and we've got a few grains here pertinent to the system that we can now match on. So generally the idea is that if something isn't going to be changing without, re without forcibly restarting the salt menu, it can be a grain. And so some of the things that are more important, let's see, the OS, the OS code name, OS release, things of that nature are more common to be matching on than targeting. Um, versions of salt, you've got information about paths, relative, so we know what the Python path of the running minion is, things like that. Um, I'm a big fan of the server ID down here. This is a number. This is a number that uses a couple of the existing grains, and then it generates a number that will be static for that minion. So you've just got this, this unique numeric identifier as well. Can't tell you how many times I've actually needed that in real deployments. But anyway, we've got some grains here. And so let's say that we want to match based on a grain. So we say capital G, OS, Fedora, and since we're running Fedora, it's going to return. If I say, I only, I only want to hear from the Arch Linux systems, it'll go out and it'll say, anybody run an Arch? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> no. Okay, just sad, I'm a big fan of Arch. <laughs> Arch is good stuff. I, I used to be a TU, so I used to be an Arch contributor until I ran out of time. <laughs> okay, so that's grains. Any questions on grains? Does that make sense, or have I left people reeling and confused already? All right, we can pass an explicit list. The main idea between... I, I've actually had arguments with people about passing a list because they go, I could just define a list inside of a glob or a regex. Why would I define an explicit list of minions? And I remind them that there's this thing called an API and it likes to be passed like a data structure called the list. And then they're quiet. <laughs> but anyway, you can pass an explicit list. So we can say L minion if we had another one then we could just comma delimit them so that we have a very clear list of who's going to reply, okay? Next we've got compound targets. Compound targets are, I think, rather cool because it allows you to take multiple target types and then bring them together with and or, or not statements so that you're able to say things like, I want to target everybody that's running Fedora, but not if their OS release is 16, and not if they've got more than eight CPUs, and not if they're, but in, and only if their name starts with foo, and you can make this huge string that has this very aggressive matching context, and run it, and only some very specific guys are going to return. Next, we've got node groups. Node groups allow you to put compound targets inside of the master's configuration file so that you're able to define some huge, hairy compound target and never type it again because nobody wants to do that and just specify it in, in your master config file and be done. Okay. Now, I'm going to run through a couple of functions, which is, yeah, we're, we're about good on time, and talk a little bit about what's available inside of this API. And really, when, when we dilute down what SALT is, it's high-speed remote execution and a big O systems API. And everything else is stacked on top of it, which is why I use the term stack. So, we've been running test.ping. 
That means that there's a module. It's just a Python module. It's called test. And I'll show it to you guys here in a second. And it has a function called ping. Similarly, we can run this guy, which I think is rather useful, sys.doc, because all of the salt minions are fundamentally self-documenting. And so if we want to find out every method, or sorry, every function that's available out there, then we can run sys.doc. It's going to go to the minion, and the minion's going to, rather quickly, it takes far much, much longer to actually print it, um, but it's going to give us a dump of all of the functions that are available in the current salt API. And so if we wanted to actually deal with this, then we're going to pipe it through less, of course. And we're going to get a broken pipe for some reason. Thank you. Generally, less is more than more, but there are exceptions. <laughs> Thank you. Now, and we can see that we've got functions for alias the aliases file for uh, mail servers. <laughs> We've got functions that take care of archives. But KVM is deprecated, don't use it. <laughs> We've got the CMD function that allows us to execute, just shell out to anything that we'd like. The copy function is used as the backplane for salt copy and for downloading files from the master. We're going to talk about that a little more when we talk about states. But basically, we can use the master as a file server and then distribute files via the master's ZeroMQ file server. Some copy functions. There's a bunch. OK, managing cron. So we can go in and get dumps and reports about everything that's going on inside of, inside of your user cron files. Data, I was just talking to Seth last night, who's the main salt guy back there, and explaining that I think da the data module is really cool, but nobody ever seems to use it. Um, but that allows you to keep a salt-specific data cache per minion of just anything you want in a key value store. OK. A couple things about disks. We've got some Django management, file management. It keeps going. There we go. More file management. Running sed commands. Commenting on commenting. I'm, I'm rather excited about this one. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the people in the competition space use Ruby, but uh, apparently so do we. So we have support for gem management in Ruby. Git. Anyway, as you can see, it keeps going. And there's more. If you want to add some, go ahead. I like pull requests. I, I certainly didn't write all of these myself. There's too many. Okay. Managing the host file keeps going. So sys.doc, self-documenting. Let's say we don't want that whole list because we're not insane. <laughs> we can just pass it one thing. And so I said, tell me everything inside of the package module. And so it tells us everything inside of the package module. Now, this is the next little tidbit about these modules and about these functions. And that is that, and here we are looking at the package module. Well, well what, what does the package module mean? It means that it's going to wrap back to the package manager that is used by the specific underlying platform. And so, in this case, we've got a Fedora minion. And so, pkg.install is going to use yum. Let's say we've got an Arch minion. It's going to be using Pac-Man. Let's say we've got a Debian minion or an Ubuntu minion. It's going to be using Abcat. Let's say it's FreeBSD. If it's FreeBSD 8, then it's going to use PKG. If it's FreeBSD um, 9, it's going to use PKG next gen. If it's Gen 2, it's going to use eBuild. So you get the idea. Automatically pass through and normalize the majority of the functions. I've actually, and I, I, frankly, I don't like this, but people are starting to do it. They're starting to actually use Salt to bypass their package managers natively so that they don't deal with them 
and I inform them that they need to know what the devil they're doing on their systems if they're administering. <laughs> but people are doing that. Anyway, any questions so far? All right. Yeah. Almost. Very. There's one. De hmm? Pi crypto? Yes. Pi crypto does. M2 crypto doesn't. The, pri the, primary, the primary issue pre preventing us from supporting Python 3, we've actually got, got the salt source um, uh, set up dual. So it'll run under Python 2 or Python 3. Um, the main issue that we're running into right now is that to use PyCrypto to manage PEM encoded RSA keys, you need to manually, manually extract the RSA numeric components. Um, and what, it, what that fundamentally boils down to is that I haven't written a bare decryptor yet. Um, and once we do that, then we can get rid of M2 Crypto because M2 Crypto does that for us. And M2 Crypto is the only depth that we have that doesn't run on Python 3. So that's, that's what's on the timeline, is for me to sit down and write a bear decryptor. <laughs> but other than that, yes. <laughs> one, one thing left on the list to get on Python 3. Um, and, and a lot of the code has been written from the get-go with the intent of making sure that we can run on Python 3 eventually because we're not crazy. <laughs> All right. Actually, we are crazy. Any, anybody who undertakes the, uh, the endeavor to create large pieces of software when they're not being paid to do it has to be somewhat nuts, just a little bit. <laughs> All right. So we've got a good example here of a compound command, in which case we're saying, this, this is actually a horrible example of a compound command now that I'm looking at it. We're saying everybody and Fedora. Well, that's silly. <laughs> but anyway, compound command meaning that we can say a certain expression and, or, or not. And then we say the type of matcher, ampersand, and then the actual target statement. Now, I think this is the, the last explanatory slide. But let's say that we don't want to run a function through the remote execution system. Let's say we just want to directly access a piece of the API locally. Now, we're going to see a lot more of this, particularly um, when we're writing modules and talking about how to easily debug modules when we're writing them. So it could be a bit of a pain to say, OK, I'm going to log into my minion. I'm going to write a module. I'm going to put a module up here. Then I'm going to log into my master. I'm going to execute the module and then, and then see if something happens. It's generally easier to do, do everything locally. So it's really good at debugging those things. Also, if you're running more complicated commands, um, particularly running the state system, which is configuration management, uh, oftentimes you want to be able to run that locally because you're going to A, get a little more information as to what's going on because you'll have full, full direct access to debug log output while it's running instead of just getting the, the return data structure. But it's a great way to debug your states. And, um, uh, and like I was saying, some people just use the SALT API directly. So let's take a look here. This is done with SALT call. To use salt call, you need to have a minion installed. You don't need to have a minion running. It's going to start all that up independent of your running minion. And so we can run salt call. Since we're not remotely executing, we're, we're executing something on the local minion itself. We have no targeting. It's only going to run locally. And then run a function. And it runs. Okay. And, since, and it's, it's never going to return with its ID. It's always going to say, this is local. The local guy returned this. Because again, salt call is never going to be accessing more than one minion, the minion that you're on. Also, salt call is self-documenting. 
So we can pass a dash D, which says, give me the documentation on that function that's, that's here locally. We can see, oh, test.ping. Just used to make sure the minion's up and responding. Return true. So anyway, salt call is your friend. You really will use salt call. Oh, yes, I forgot about this slide. Excellent. Now, um, one of the problems that I ran into early on was the fact that uh, I don't always have access to play around with um, a server environment that has, say, 5,000 to 10,000 systems on it. I'm just not that rich yet. We're working on that. Uh, but so we started to run into the occasional bug when somebody came back and said, hey, I just deployed salt on a, on a 10,000 minion system and I ran into this problem and I said, well, I can't reproduce that because I've only got a server in my basement. So it's just, just a few at the, at the time. We, we have a little more iron now. We're, we're getting there. <laughs> but, um, but so I put together Minion Swarm. Minion Swarm fires up a ton of salt minions on one system so that you can simulate uh, what it would look like if you were attaching to many, many, many minions. Now, I think that it's a whole lot of fun to play around with and uh, kind of have competitions with people to see, hey, how many minions can you get going on your laptop? You know, how much iron do you have in your house because you can get so many minions before you run out of RAM and uh, kernel panic. <laughs> so. Take a, there we go. I'll fire up on my laptop instead of a VM because I've got a little more RAM here. And I was hoping I'd be able to get into my server at home, but apparently not, where I've got a lot more RAM and I can actually fire up a thousand minions and show you what that looks like but I can only get up to about 40 or so on this laptop. Um, so let's see. Get rid of that. Good, we don't have any minions running. So if you look into the salt source code, there's a test directory. And in there, because Minion Swarm isn't, isn't distributed with salt, it's, it's part of a test system. But there we go, Minion Swarm. This, this is an Archbox, so I have to say Python 2. For those of you who are familiar with that wonderful situation inside of Arch. I'll fire up 40. Actually, I'm, I'm going to play it safe. I don't want to kill my machine. They, they do use a little bit of RAM when you fire up many of them. I'm going to tell them to only load a couple of modules. Oh, this must be an old checkout. I suppose I'll not tell them to only load a few modules. If you tell them to only load a few modules, this modules they use a little less RAM, so you can squeeze a few more minions onto a server. Okay, my fan fires up because I'm now generating 25 RSA key pairs for all of these minions. I've got this master running in open mode because I use it for testing and I don't want to deal with having to accept lots of minion keys when I'm starting up swarms. But we see that we've fired up this minion swarm. We've got 25 of them. It's a pretty small swarm. And it gives them all these incredibly unique IDs. Yeah, it looks like we're all here. And we see what it looks like. So now we're running test.ping on 25 minions. And actually, um, when you're running a minion swarm, it's usually a little slower than it is over a real network just because you're beating the tar out of your local system. 
Yeah, that's a lot slower than normal. Normally it's about 0.2 seconds, 0.2 to 0.3 seconds. Okay. But so yeah, minion swarms are fun. And we can get lots and lots of grains and et cetera, et cetera. All right. Any questions? Everybody feeling all right about that? Not too much of a waste of time? Okay. Um, we're going to take a bit of a break for about five, ten minutes while I get ready to uh, put together the next, uh, the next slides, uh, which are going to go over uh, salt. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra's or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra's. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. 
if you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks' notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. <laughs>